And so now I invite you to open your Bibles to our scripture reading there in Acts, to the book of Acts. The Gospel according to Luke in the book of Acts. You know that Dr. Luke wrote the book of Acts. And every book in the Bible is a gospel. Every single book in the Bible from Revelation, Leviticus, every single one is the good news of Jesus Christ. And so turn to the gospel according to Luke in the book of Acts to chapter 9, verse 10 and 11 here where the Lord is calling a man named Ananias and said to him, the Lord said, said in a vision, Ananias, and he said, here I am. So the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying. Behold, he is praying. A couple of weeks ago, we looked at this Saul who became Paul. And just as the review, before we get to Ananias' response to go and meet this Saul, and notice, the Lord doesn't just say Saul, Saul of Tarsus. Yes, Ananias, that's Saul who is coming after you. That same Saul. We, we, we learned a couple of weeks ago regarding the first verses of Acts chapter 9 that God cannot save an unsubmissive heart, an unsubmissive person, a person who is not willing to submit to the Lord, God cannot save. God has to knock you off your horse for you to become submissive and realize that submitting our hearts to God is the requirement to be saved. God cannot save also a person who cannot admit that they're wrong. He can't. You see, if you fight against the Holy Spirit, you cannot be saved. And the, the Holy Spirit will plead and plead with every single one of you and myself. But He will not argue with us. He'll just plead with you and plead with you. Because you see, You've all been there when someone begins an argument. And if you return the argument, you're actually lowering to their level and throwing the ball back and forth and fighting in between the argument. The Holy Spirit isn't going to, to, to argue with us, but he will plead to our hearts, convict our, our hearts, and plead to, to submit to God. The natural response of a submissive person is someone willing to admit that they're wrong when they're wrong. Amen? So God can do a lot with a submissive person. And God can save anyone who can consistently admit that they're wrong. And isn't that what confession is? We're confessing, Lord, I am wrong. I've done this. Lord, forgive me for this. Lord, or even confessing with each other. If we've wronged somebody and going to them and say, brother, sister, I'm sorry, I apologize, forgive me for this, forgive me for that. And we're looking at, at Saul here and we saw also la two weeks ago that was he just a common Pharisee or was he, as he says himself, a Pharisee of Pharisees, right? He would consider himself the cream of the crop. And he was from the tribe of Benjamin. He was um, taught in the best schools. And don't forget that Pharisees, you know, they memorized the Pentateuch. So, so Saul could, re could, could quote from Genesis to where? To Deuteronomy by memory. Wow. But you see, this is a big lesson because a mind full of only scripture and not the Holy Spirit is a dangerous person. And we looked at that last, and we looked at that last week, that Saul was, was full of scripture, religious person, but what? Perse a persecutor, a murderer. And persecuting God's people. A mind full of scripture does not mean it is full of submission. And God had to teach him that to be humble, to submit 
himself. And this is why I, I think that Adventism can, can be, not is, but can be dangerous. Because we are full of scripture. Aren't we not? We should be. Amen. And yes, we are. We, we, we have answers from the Bible for the question that people have today. Why is this happening in the world? Why is that happening in the world? Answers to the great controversy, answers to the great questions. Where do we come from? What are we doing here? Where are we going? The Bible has given us these answers. What is Jesus and what is he doing now? And why hasn't he come? And so many questions. We as Seventh-day Adventists have Bible knowledge and scripture. But yet, has it made us more Christian? No. Why? Because just having the knowledge of the scripture isn't enough. Saul had the Pentateuch memorized and could quote, but yet his heart wasn't submissive to the Holy Spirit. His heart wasn't submissive to the voice of God. And God's, but yet, it should be encouraging, friends, because God saw something in Saul that could be usable. And that is why, actually, you and I are in church today. Because God saw something in you and in me that can be usable. And amen. God sees something in us, not according to what we see, but what God sees. And because of this, God has an assignment for every single one of us. God has God had an assignment for Saul. God had an assignment for Ananias. And God has an assignment for you and an assignment for me. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we look here through this story, your assignment for us, we ask for your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So Saul believed that he was doing God's assignment. Okay, he, he believed he was doing God's assignment when he was out persecuting and, uh, and putting in prison. And when you read there, in Acts chapter 9, he had no mercy. He would, he would take women, children, you know, he, he didn't care. He had no sympathy and no mercy, and yet he thought he was doing God's assignment. But what happened to Saul on his road to Damascus? He got knocked off. His horse. And there in Acts chapter 9, verse 10, he gets knocked off his horse. And verse 10 says there, as we read, that he gives a vision to Ananias. Now, Ananias there was a Christian. Maybe he was a pastor or a leader. But God sends him a vision to go visit Saul. And Ananias knows about Saul. And what is Ananias' response? There in verse 13. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has, uh, and here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. Notice num number one, that Ananias begins even a dialogue with the Lord. The Lord says, go and visit Saul. Normally we would say, yes, sir. But Ananias has that relationship, that bond. that He, he says, Lord, you're talking about the Saul who, who was responsible for stoning Stephen. I've heard about him. He's out to come and get me. Why would I go visit him? I'm not sure I want to go there, Lord. How many of you would go? You know, today there are, there are places in the world where Christianity cannot be practiced. And how many would go if the Lord gave you a vision and a mission and an assignment? Go and talk to this individual that you know is out purposely putting in prison and killing Christians. You see, here Ananias, God gave him an assignment. And he just wanted to make sure, Lord, I don't want to go there. But notice God's response there in verse 15. And God's response is our response also from the Lord. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine. 
Just those words right there. Go. Why? Because I chose him. Because I've chosen him. Friends, God has chosen you. God has chosen you. There was one time in your life that you were like Saul, that we were like Saul. Kicking against the goals, kicking against the bricks. Against God. Unsubmissive. And praise the Lord. We let the Holy Spirit in. We became submissive to the Lord. But you and I are a chosen vessel of God. A chosen vessel of God. And so here he says, Go, for he is, a, he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And this is what God says about you and about me. You see, the devil, the devil says that there is nothing useful in Harley. But yet God says, I've chosen him. I've died for him. I've bled for him. And so he is mine. And he says that about every single one of you as well. That he has chosen you. He died for you. And he has an assignment for you. God has an assignment for us. In Philippians chapter 3, if you turn your Bibles to Philippians chapter 3, we see that salvation, our Christian walk, is a process. Philippians chapter 3, verse 8. Philippians chapter 3, verse 8. It says, but indeed, okay, this, this, these are the words of Paul, the same Saul who we're talking about. But indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. Amen. Amen. He'd rather lose everything but not lose Christ. And be found in him not having my own righteousness. Notice this. What a transition, okay, from what we read earlier about Saul. Not having my own righteousness, which is a form, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, being conformed to his death. If by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Notice verse 12. And not that I have already attained or am already what? Perfected. But I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. And then he says, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended. Again, another time. But one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the price of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. This here is the, is the Christian walk, is the process of salvation. These verses here. Paul is... is, is is being so transparent and saying, I haven't ob obtained it. I'm still reaching day by day. I haven't perfected yet. And then he invites us. He invites us to continue pressing forward the goal. So brothers and sisters, don't be so hard on yourself. If you fall, you think, well... I've gone too far. I've done too much. I haven't read the Bible in a long time. I haven't prayed in a long time. Friends, yes, we should keep up with the Lord in our daily devotion, in our daily study. We may get discouraged, but don't be so hard on yourself or so hard on others. Because it is a Christian walk it is a Christian walk and, 
And someone messes up or we may mess up and here Paul is telling us that I haven't obtained it. If anyone would have obtained it, I would have think Paul. Zealous for God, a missionary, a soul winner, a church planter. I mean, any conference president would be happy with the ministry of Saul. They would even want everyone to copy Saul's methods because they see the results. But yet Saul is here. What is he saying? I haven't obtained it. I am still striving toward the goal. I am still striving toward the goal. So I just want to encourage you if, er, if there is ever a time that you may feel I'm slacking behind. Our salvation is a daily Christian walk. And, and in, as in other places, um, Paul mentions it, from glory to glory, from glory to glory, we become changed and transformed. So going back to Acts chapter 9, how did God lead Saul into accepting his assignment? You see, Saul thought that he was on, on God's assignment, but that wasn't God's ass assignment at all. On the contrary, the, the Lord says, why are you persecuting me? So how did God lead or change Saul into accepting his assignment? And the way he led and changed Saul, he will change us to accepting his assignment as well. Notice number one, Acts 9 verse 1. There where it says, Then Saul still breathing threats and murders against the disciples of the Lord. God calls you, number one, where you're at. Amen. Praise the Lord that God does, doesn't wait to call you until you're in here. Praise the Lord that God doesn't wait to call you until you start keeping most of the commandments. Or until you start having a morning prayer. No, he calls you where you're at. And here, while Saul was still breathing threats and murders against the disciples, God calls him. Some of you, God has called you in the bars or in other places. And actually, you know, some of the best soul winners or some of the really great preachers were terrible people growing up. Were terrible people growing up but God found them and they submitted their heart to God and became great soul winners and great ex preachers and expositors of God's word and here Saul wasn't a great person but yet became one of God's greatest missionaries one of God's greatest preachers so keep in mind that God calls you where you're at God calls people where they're at if someone is in the ditches, God still is calling them. And if God is calling them, then we should also be tender-kinded and willing to call them to. Amen? Amen? We shouldn't shun people until, until, until they get their act together. Then maybe you can come into our group. No. Friends, one thing about Adventism... Uh, is that we like to have our own little groups. Yeah? Yes. We like to have our own little groups. And you can tell, you know, at fellowship lunch or sometimes after church, um, you can really tell it in Hispanic churches. Your own little groups. But yet God is calling everyone and he, because He calls you where you're at, we should also be willing to call and accept and bring people not into little groups but into all one big group the family of God the family of God God found Saul while he was still persecuting God's people and he called him and notice verse 6 there what else does God do well God shows God showed him who he really was in verse 6 after he knocked him down, he it says, So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And the Lord said, Arise and go to the city, and you will be told what to do. God will show you what you really are. And here, the prideful Saul that we see in verse 1, now in verse 6, trembling and astonished and scared. 
What happened to that Saul that was ready to go into Damascus? Now he is scared, trembling, and even asking, Lord, what do you want me to do? God shows us where we really are. God shows you that you don't belong in your high horse and shows you how we really are and our problem is. And you become most savable in the moment you realize that you don't deserve to be saved, actually. We become more savable when we realize we don't deserve to be saved. God can work with a humble heart more than with a prideful heart. Comparing just verse 1 with verse 6, you can see the difference there of Saul. And notice verse 8 and verse 9. He teaches even Saul to depend on God. In verse 8, it says, Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were open, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into the Damascus. Nobody saw what the leader. And now they're leading Saul. He can't see, so they're leading him into Damascus. And he was there three days without sight and neither ate nor drank. You know, when someone doesn't eat or drink, what is that normally a sign of? Depression. I don't think, this wasn't a fast of, let me get closer to God and fast. Think of Saul and his view of Christianity and how his whole world just turned upside down. And now knowing that he was willing, that he wanted to do God's will was actually fighting against God. Depression, the guilt. I can, I'm sure that through his mind went all the people he put in prison, all the children, all the women, the stoning of Stephen. See, that's called conviction by the Holy Spirit. That is called conviction by the Holy Spirit. And he learned to become dependent on God. To become dependent on God. Notice even before that, in Acts 9.17, where Ananias, you know, does Ananias eventually do God's assignment? Yes, he does. He's, God says, he is mine, I've chosen him, go. And he goes. He goes in the name of Jesus, friends. That is the only way to do God's assignment. Keeping in mind that, uh, that, that Ananias is taking God's word that Saul is not going to kill him. And on the only way you can do that is in the name of Jesus, I'm going to go and see this man who is out to get me. And he goes and does God's assignment. And in verse 17 it says, And Ananias went his way and entered the house and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother. He didn't say Saul. He didn't say persecutor. He didn't say fool. What did he call him? Brother. Brother Saul. What a lesson, friends. Ananias was beginning to see Saul like God saw him as a brother in Christ. Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. The person who is putting his hands on Saul is a person who Saul was going to go and kill and put in prison. Saul has to depend on the brother that he was going to go out and persecute. Saul has to depend on his enemy, we can say, for him to receive his sight. For him to, 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 to continue with his life. Friends, God will set us straight one way or another. Even if he has to humble us. Can you imagine still Saul's mind knowing that Ananias was a Christian, maybe a leader, and he was, maybe, he, maybe, maybe even Saul had his name on his list. Let me go to Ananias' house. And now here 
his enemy is putting his hands on him and praying to receive back his sight. Saul had to learn to depend on God, to be dependent on God. And when, when he became dependent, no, look at verse 19 and verse 20, God will, tr will give you a tryout. He'll give you an assignment. There in 19 it says, And when he had received food, he was strengthened. Then Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. Immediately he preached the Christ in the synagogue that he is the Son of God. If you compare back to verse 1 and then back to verse 19 and 20, do you see a complete different person? Somebody who, who went to, no, I'm not going to do that, who is now doing the will of God. Now doing God's assignment. In just three days or more, give or take, one thing that, that I want to bring out is that did Saul ever come out of his depression or of his anguish, of his, of his, oh, I can't even describe it, of his anguish, of being a persecutor and he would want to do God's will and he was persecuting the one that he worshiped. Did he ever move on from that? Or did he continue staying in his depression, in his anguish for days and days? No. You see that he, he and, and I'm sure that Ananias has something to do with it. I'm sure that Ananias spent time with him there. And helping him not just to accept God's forgiveness, but to move on because God has bigger plans for you. And you see that there in verse, tw in, in verse 20, immediately he preached. And then, I'm sorry, verse 19. And when he had received food, he was strengthened. Then Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. And I'm sure that in those days with the disciples, strengthen him to not look back at what he used to be and not let that get him down, put him down. Friends, what a lesson for us. What a lesson for us. Sometimes we make big mistakes. And sometimes we're unwilling to continue with our life. And we sit and sit and sit and think and ponder on those mistakes and those consequences. And I know that it's not polite, I understand, to say, move on. But here, Saul, God, the only way that he moved on was with the, was with the help of God. The only way with the help of God and the disciples and Ananias and he, immediately he preached. Immediately indicates he wasn't too long uh, depressed. He, immediately he preached the Christ in the synagogue that he is the Son of God and God gives him a tryout and he does his assignment, he does the work of God. And Saul is preaching the Jesus he was working against. Amen. When you accept God's assignment, He will give you a tryout. He will let you work and do service for Him. He will give you a tryout. And not just give you a tryout, but God trusts you even with results. Notice verse 22. But Saul increased all the more in strength and, conf and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that this Jesus is the Christ. He was getting results. He was proving to the Jews that Jesus is the Messiah. When you accept God's assignment, friends, He gives you a tryout and He trusts you with results. He trusts you with results. Friends, there is nothing like a Christian who has recognized and accepted God's assignment. God's assignment. You are called, you and I are called into the church for service. Amen. You and I are called into the church for service. Amen. Not just to fill a pew, 
but for service. What type of service? I mean, there is praying for others. There is sharing your food, visiting the sick, singing in the choir. <clears throat> operating a camera, operating a sound system, volunteering in a ministry, passing out tracks, greeting people in the front, helping in the music department, in Sabbath school lessons, in Sabbath school uh, classes, in small groups. There are many, many and plenty of opportunities in serving for God. Plenty. Why are you here? The church, the church, as I heard it once said, the church is not an observation post. Where you just come and let's just see what's going on here. No. The church is a place for service. To serve God. To serve God. You know how, you know how many times in the Bible the relationship between Christ and his church is like a marriage. Right? And the Christ is coming for his bride. And so, so, just like in a marriage, each other, you're, if you love your spouse, what did I say? If you love your spouse, you will serve your spouse. Amen. Amen. Love, service is love. And love is serving. If you love your spouse, you will serve your spouse and your spouse will serve you. And that's why sometimes, you know, sometimes you see that, that, uh, that service for each other and wanting to not just please each other, but even do stuff for each other. No, I'll get that for you. No, let me do this for you. Why? Because there's that love. And part of that love, it ignites to serve you. To serve you. And when, we, and when we have the love of God ignited in our hearts, our desire is to serve Him. To serve Him. Now, I don't know why you are here, or what you can do, or what you were called to serve at. The call doesn't come from your pastor, it comes from God. It doesn't come from me, but it comes from God. So you tell me what you want to do. You talk to the Lord, and the Lord impresses you to do something, and you tell me what you want to do. You tell Pastor Austin what you want to do. Now, I don't want to hear, well, let me pray about it to see if God wants me to serve. We already know God wants you to serve. You know, there are things that with the Bible is clear about the will of God. Is it the will of God for us to keep His commandments? Yes. Do we need to pray if that is God's will? No. It is, it is God's will. It is His will, right? Is it God's will to love one another? Yes. Right? Is it God's will to serve in His church? Yes. So your prayer should be, Lord, lead me in the direction you want me to serve. Lead me in the direction you want me to serve. <clears throat> Find something that suits your talent. But not only that, friends. Find something that suits your talent, but also scary enough that makes you dependent on God. You want something that suits your talent, but also gives you fear that it makes you dependent on God. And not dependent on yourself, but dependent on God. You see, that's why I'm a preacher. Because if anybody was shy in this world, shyer than me didn't exist <laughs> I was shyer than shy shyer than Piglet you know who Piglet is from Winnie the Pooh <laughs> he was so he is, a, he is a character that is so timid you know and was so shy you know oh Pooh I can't do that you know he he wouldn't do anything so timid and shy anybody grew up here watching Winnie the Pooh nobody did just me and my sister Shyer than shy, you can ask my wife if you don't believe me, <clears throat> which you should believe me. <clears throat> so shy that when I became interested in Salid, I could not come to the nerve to say hi, to what is your name. Somebody gave me a wrong name for her to begin with. <laughs> so what did I do? I was really interested in Salid 
and to wanted to get to know more her and to start dating her and courting her. And so I went and became friends with her father. <laughs> and I asked her father, you know, you have a very, he has three daughters. And I said, your youngest daughter is very pretty. Um, I would like to take her out to eat one Saturday night. And her father says, sure, absolutely. So not even knowing <laughs> that she was going to go out the next Saturday out to eat. <laughs> and let me give, let me just, this is in my note, this is free right here. <laughs> let me give you some advice, gentlemen and ladies. You want somebody, you want to look for somebody that respects their parents. That respects their parents. When her father came the next Saturday night after the AY program and he says, Honey, you're going to go out to eat with uh, Harley here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if, you, if you say so, yes, yes, Poppy. And I, w w w when I saw that, I just remember my mom's words. If they respect their father, they will respect you. If they respect their parents, if they, if they, as the commandment says, honor their mother and father, they will honor you. So keep that in mind as you are looking for your special person, if you are dating somebody. Get out of your mind the, the, the illusion that, well, I'm going to change them. That No. God can change a person. But don't think that you can do it. And so, so shyer than shy, not even willing to come up and give a welcome or read a, script, a scripture, and yet God has me here standing before you, and I am still shy. <laughs> I still consider myself a shy person. And speaking here, or speaking in the, in the Sabbath school, as I was earlier with the young adults, just speaking in front of a group of people, I have to depend a lot on God. Number one, because I grew up with a stuttering problem. That could be a good, legitimate reason why not to speak in public. But the Bible says, I can do all things through Christ. And He will give me the strength to do it. So I am here before you, trembling, but also scared enough that it makes me dependent on God. Dependent on God. God cannot save. God cannot save an unsubmissive person, but God can do much with a submissive person. A person who submits their hearts and their wills to Him. And in the same way, God cannot save a person who cannot admit that they're wrong, but God can save any person who can consistently admit that they're wrong. So friends, I just want to appeal to you this morning. God has something for you to do. He absolutely does. He absolutely does. If you think, well, I can't drive after late or I can't move around so much. Friends, there are many ministries where you can do it from your home. We have a phone committee where we call and pray for each other. There are many ministries as well that can be done from the home or from the church or from many locations, friends. There is a job for every single one of you and myself. And God is calling us for service. And my prayer is that each one of us pray, Lord, lead me to the ministry, to the work you want me to do. Here we see that God had an assignment for Saul. Saul was going the, totally the wrong way. And God had to call him where he was at. God calls you where you're at. If you're just a, pure, a, a pew, pew warmer or a pew sitter, God will call you where you're at. And he will show you how you really are, your real need of him. He will teach you to be dependent, to be dependent upon him. <clears throat> and he will give you <clears throat> excuse me, a tryout, an assignment. And he will trust you with results, friends. He will trust you with results. You know, we are told to do what is right and leave the results and the consequences to God. God will take care of it, friends. God will take care of it. So God has an assignment for each and one of us. And my question and my appeal is, will you heed his call? 
Will you heed his call? Will you listen to his call? It's not my call. I don't know what your talents are. I don't know what the things you like to do are. But you know where they are. And I ask that you pray, not for, Lord, should I, but Lord, where do I sign up? Where do I sign up? In what place do you want me to serve? Let us know, let any of the elders know, and we will be happy, more than happy, to put you in the service of God. It's not, it's not in the service for me. It's in the service of God, friends. With even much more trembling, we should say yes. God bless you, church. God bless you. Remember that Jesus, when he comes, he will say, well done, good and faithful servant. Good and faithful servant. Are we serving the Lord? Are we serving the Lord, friends? Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, you've called us to follow you. And we love you, Lord, because you called us and you saved us even while we did not love you. And thank you. Thank you for... <clears throat> thank you for the death of your Son, Jesus Christ, which is evidence of your love for us and your salvation that you offer us. Thank you very much. And Lord God, you save us to help to, so that we may serve you. And so I just ask you, oh God, that, you, that your Holy Spirit may convict every single one of our hearts to serve you. To serve you. In any way that you see fit best, you know where we can have the most and better influence. So Father, I just ask that you bless every member here, those that are serving, those that are active. Lord, continue to bless them and continue to give them the strength and thank you because they have heeded to your call of service. But Lord, there are others here still that can serve and have the time to serve and the energy and strength. And so Lord, I just ask that your Holy Spirit speak to them so that when you come, you may look at the Cleburne Church and say, well done, good and faithful servants. Father in heaven, bless your church, not just here in Cleburne, but all around the world. Your people. Thank you very much for everything that you do for us. Please do not remove your Holy Spirit, but bring him stronger and closer to our hearts. Forgive us if we have displeased you in any way. And I ask that you bless your congregation here this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.